the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end forever you and i will be in heaven or hell period okay last night we talked about the nature and mission of the catholic family the nature of the catholic family is holiness okay holy the family is called to be holy the mission of the catholic family holiness sanctity the mission of the redeemer you can't give what you don't have priests in the old days learned a latin expression nemo dot quod non habit you cannot give what you do not have being precedes doing your very essence precedes action you've got to be before you do you have to become christ before you do the works of Christ. You understand that principle? You learn principles, you learn. You've got to learn principles. Being precedes doing. In order to do the works of Christ, that's what we're called to, right? We're the members of the body of Christ. We're called to do the works of Jesus. Jesus said the, the servants know no better, no different than his master. You have to become Christ. That's holiness. That's a function of prayer. That's a function of the sacramental life of the church. That's a function of virtue. Okay? You have to become the living presence of Christ. And then you're capacitated, you're enabled to do the works of Christ. That's the principle. Okay? What's the, the essence, the nature, the work of the family? The same as that of Christ. The same as each individual member of the family. You've got to become holy, and then you will diffuse that holiness. You can't give what you do not have. We're going to talk now in this session about sex. We should have the media here. <laughs> right? They'd love it, right? You, you can go home and tell all your friends, I went to a conference and Father Croppy talked about sex. I'll be getting called into the bishop's office, probably. Well, you have to. My goodness, you know. Uh, and, and you don't have to be ashamed about it or afraid of it. It's absolute reality, right? And nowadays, it's in your face every place you look. What's the church's teaching on it, though? How should we think? I entitled it Sex, Sacred, Not Evil. It's not dirty, it's not bad, it's part of God's plan, it's part of God's creation. But you have to understand the context in which it is. You have to understand why. What's it for? I can tell you what it's not for. It's not a sport. Hmm? It's not merely a recreational activity. It's not merely something to do. It is sacred. Now, let me try to, in a simple way, tell you what it is. It's a gift, first of all. Okay? Sexuality and the expression thereof is a gift given by God to humanity. The exercise of that gift is the prerogative of married persons. In the context, the sacred context, I, I, I want to emphasize that word, the sacred context of a sacrament called matrimony. You know, from the very beginning, from creation, the book of Genesis, says God created them, male and female. He created them. Absolutely equal in dignity, he created them, but not the same did he create them. Equal in dignity, but not the same. Equal in dignity as persons, 
Men are no more noble or dignified than women, and women are no more noble or dignified than men. Equal in dignity, nobility, beauty before God, but not the same. Out of our, how could I say it, out, out of the differences, you know, you have men and women. Out of your nature flows certain responsibilities, certain things you do. I've often uh, explained this. Some of you have heard me talk about, uh, I'll never be a mother. Profound statement, right? I mean, I'll, I'll ne I happen to think maternity, motherhood, is one of the greatest gifts imaginable. A, a mother, it's hard to imagine a greater vocation than that. You know, beautiful. And I, ha I have the highest regard for mothers, but I'll never be one. But should I be put out? Should I be upset? Should I cry foul? No. Why can't I be a mother? Because it does not flow from my nature. It's not proper. Only women can be mothers. Well, does that mean that men are inferior? No. It just means that they're different. And out of those differences flow complementary dimensions. Male and female, he created them. In the context of that sacrament, that sacred thing, the man and the woman come together in that, in that sacrament. Now what happens, what is sexuality? Well, when it's expressed in marital love, there are two essential dimensions, and they can never be artificially separated and remain in the grace and goodness of God. The unitive and the procreative. Two dimensions. The unitive, that concerns the love of the spouses for each other. Husband and wife have an interchange of love. And, and I'll tell you, you have to go right back to the fundamental truth of our faith, the Trinity, in order to understand this theologically and philosophically. There is one God. That one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you know how the persons of the Trinity are are said to be. From all eternity, the Father loves the Son. From all eternity, the Son loves the Father. From all eternity, the exchange, the mutual exchange of love between the Father and the Son, as we say in theology, spirates or breathes forth the Holy Spirit, personified love. Now, in that mystery of the Trinity is wrapped up the mystery of marital love. The husband and the wife, in a sense mirroring the love of the Trinity, express that love in a mutual exchange that's emotional, that's physical, and that is even spiritual. It is a high, noble, and beautiful thing. Together, expressing their love, they enter into a sacred place, a sanctuary called the creative dimension. God the creator. Now man and wife, husband and wife, together, are allowed to enter into the holy of holies of God's creative love, and they procreate, right? Mom and dad, together, mutual exchange of love, mirroring God's love. What happens? New life. That is not a small thing. We tend to trivialize that. We are not very high thinkers in general. We take it for granted. We just look at it biologically. Listen, we're not mere animals. 
We are not merely animals. Yes, we have a biological dimension, a physical dimension, sure. But much more, much more than that. You have to understand that sexuality is a gift and it is sacred. It is often, however, profaned. Do you understand what profanation is? Let me explain it for you very simply. Profanation, and I could use the word sacrilege too, uh, synonymously. Profanation is to take something holy and reduce it to profane use. I'll give you an example. We, we celebrated Mass this morning, and you know at Mass you have the sacred vessels, the chalice and the paten, right? And we, we put wine in the chalice and the host bread on the paten, and then at the words of consecration, that bread and wine is changed in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, those vessels are called sacred, sacred vessels. When they are consecrated, they are consecrated for sacred use. The word consecrated means set aside. Do you know that that comes from the same Greek word, hagios, for holiness or sacred? The patent and the chalice, in the old days, only a bishop could consecrate or bless the patent and the chalice. Now any priest can do that. But basically what it is, they, the, the prayer is a consecratory prayer. It sets aside those vessels for sacred use. In other words, you don't drink beer out of the chalice. That would be a profanation, sacrilegious. It's set aside for sacred use. From the time those sacred vessels are consecrated, or made sacred, they're set aside for sacred use alone. That means they're used at Mass, and that's the only thing they can be used for, and any other use would be, would be a profanation of that which is sacred. Do you understand that at baptism you are consecrated? You are set aside. You are made holy. And that sin is a profanation of that which is holy. St. Paul said, do you not understand that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Act accordingly. Now at marriage, the sacrament of matrimony, there's a consecration. There's a setting aside. It's a very interesting and unique sacrament. <clears throat> it's the only sacrament where the ministers of the sacrament are the individuals receiving the sacrament. No other sacrament like that. Husband and wife, the spouses, minister to each other. They exchange consent. They give themselves to each other. And it's permanent. From that moment, they are capacitated to enter into the sanctuary of God's creative love, and they are the only ones who have that blessing, that gift, that privilege. I don't and never will. But married people do. You have that gift. You have that privilege, and it's a noble one, a high one, a beautiful one. Sex is sacred. And the use of the sexual faculty can only be legitimately, licitly used inside the sacred context of marriage. Any other use of the sexual faculty is outside God's plan outside God's grace, outside God's love. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. God doesn't stop loving people who offend him. God loves the sinner. God hates the sin. Why? Because the sin hurts the one he loves. 
Okay? Please understand that. An enormous amount of damage has been done to the faith through the years by the erroneous thinking that God somehow stops loving the sinner. Mm -mm. No, God loves the sinner, but God doesn't love the sin which separates his child from him. If I love you, and I do, as my spiritual family, if you would, God forbid, uh, contract AIDS or cancer, I wouldn't stop loving you. I might even love you more. And if I had the heart and mind of Christ in my love, I would desire to alleviate your suffering. I don't like the cancer, though. I hate the AIDS that's eating you alive. I love you. I don't love the disease. And that's the way it is, the differentiation between the sinner and sin. So, husband and wife, having made a vow to each other, having ministered a sacrament to each other, remember this. In marriage, you have ministered a sacrament. It might be the only sacrament married people ever minister. Usually it is. You know, it's possible you could minister another sacrament. You could be the ministers of baptism in a case of necessity, right? Uh, anybody, anyone can baptize in case of, of grave necessity, but usually that doesn't happen. But when you got married, you ministered a sacrament. You didn't only receive a sacrament. You ministered a sacrament to each other. And from that moment on, you were given that power, that grace, that gift, that capacity to enter into a very sacred place, the place where God brings new life into existence. And so, having made a vow to each other that goes like this, everything that I am and everything that I do, I give to you. All that I am and all that I do is yours. That's the way it's supposed to be. That mutual exchange of love, that's in the heart, that's in the mind. And it is expressed physically. And that's the marital act. That's human sexuality. Every marital act, every conjugal act, must be left open to the transmission of life, to retain its innate dignity and grace. The artificial separation of the unitive from procreative dimensions of the marital act is intrinsically evil. Let me say that again, and make sure you understand it. And if you don't understand anything I'm saying, don't feel bad about that, but write down a question. And I'm going to answer those questions this afternoon at the end. Two essential dimensions in the marital act, in sex. The unitive, that is where the two express their love for each other physically. That's the unitive. They come together. Love tends toward union. Secondly, the procreative, bringing new life into existence. You can't artificially separate them. That's artificial contraception. But then you say, oh, but we can't have another child. And I sympathize with that. There are good reasons why a couple can't have another child right now, maybe indefinitely. And the church understands and permits that. For a just reason, a grave reason, good reason, not a trivial reason, a couple may defer 
conception of another child or a child, even inde indefinitely. Okay? There, there may be physical reasons. Right? Sometimes it, it can be outright dangerous for a woman uh, to conceive and have a child. There are medical reasons for that. You, you probably know them better than I do, but th it's true. So what do you do? I mean, you, they, I've had couples say, well, the doctor says if I have another child, it could jeopardize my health, my life. Do I have to, in order to be in, in tune with the church's teaching, do I have to conceive anyway? No, of course not. Of course not. Well, what do I do then? Can, can I take the pill? You know, can, can we use some other method of birth control? No. Well, what are you telling me then? It's called natural family planning. And it should be absolutely mandatory that every couple planning to get married know what it is, know how to use it. It should be taught routinely. That does not mean that you use it routinely. No, the norm is every marital act is left open to the transmission of life. Now, it's a biological fact that not every marital act will result in conception. We all know that. But it has to be left open. It cannot be artificially contraceptive. Artificial contraception is intrinsically evil. Do you know what that term intrinsically evil means? It means in itself it's evil. You can't do it. Taking the life of an innocent person, that's intrinsically evil. No amount of circumstances can change that. I can't, now that doesn't mean that, that a person can't, or a nation can't defend itself. No, that's not an innocent person, an unjust aggressor. No, no, you can take action in self-defense to stop that, but that's not what we're talking about. An intrinsically evil act. For a Catholic in good conscience. Now, by the way, there are a large number of Catholics who have and who do use artificial contraception. More than half, supposedly. Is there a justification for it? No. No. Can you do it? No. Could I be wrong? No. I'd tell you if it were a questionable area. I would, but it is not. Now, many theologians will take the opposite position. They're wrong. They're dead wrong. The encyclical Humanae Vitae by Pope Paul VI, issued July 25th, 1968, is a definitive document. Contrary to what some theologians believe and teach, it's a definitive document. Is it part of the doctrine of the faith? Yes. Must it be accepted? Yes. Is there any justification for not accepting it? No. And yet, bishops, priests, and theologians in many places throughout the last several years have rejected it, even put in writing that they rejected it. I was in Winnipeg, Canada, last year. On the very anniversary, when the vast majority of Canadian bishops penned the infamous Winnipeg statement where they rejected the teaching of Humanae Vitae, thus relegating themselves to disgrace. No artificial contraception. But there are cases where, for a serious reason, a couple may defer the birth of, or conception of another child, even indefinitely, okay? Natural family planning. I, I don't have time, and I'm not qualified to teach a course now on natural family planning, but there are people who are qualified and who do 
teach them. Doc, Dr. Uh, Janet Smith knows a lot more about a lot of these things than I do. That's her area of expertise, and I'm sure she'll talk about some of these things uh, in more detail. But the essence of what you've got to believe is that sex is not a trivial, mundane, profane, dirty, evil thing. That is not what Christianity and Catholicism teaches. On the contrary, it teaches that sexuality is a high, noble, beautiful gift given by God to his beloved children, but that it is to be used in a very well-defined environment. And that means the environment of marriage. And it is where a man and a woman, need I go into that? Where a man and a woman, not a man and a man, and not a woman and a woman. All right? Let me be real clear on that one. Now, that's a whole nother question. The question of alternative lifestyles, as they call it. That's one of the attacks on the family, which uh, don't let me forget to talk about that when I talk this afternoon on the contemporary attacks on the family. That's one of them. You know, in the moron legislators, and I didn't make a mistake <laughs> using that terminology, the idiots who try to put same-sex marriages into law are destroying society in the interest of political expediency. And make no mistake about it, it will be a large contributing factor to the demise of society as that happens. Now, that does not mean that these persons who have that sexual orientation are bad or evil. No. Uh, they, they may, for who knows what reason, that they are that way, and you can't hate them, and you can't be prejudiced and bigoted and mean to them. But you've got to tell the truth. We've got to be pastoral. We've got to be kind. We've got to be merciful and charitable. But that does not mean confirm people in their sins. Okay? You've got to tell the truth in love. And that's merciful. That's charitable. And that's pastoral. And anything other than that is not. It is very often indifference or cowardice. And we don't want to be guilty of that. So, sex is sacred. Sex is not evil. Sacred, not evil. Nowadays, it seems very often that the dignity and the nobility of the sacrament of matrimony is played down, even demeaned. And those who are open to life are often attacked for that very reason. They are ridiculed. I, I have friends who have six, seven, eight, nine children I saw some one couple down in Atlanta recently when I was preaching, and I've known them for a long time. And uh, I said, uh, how, how many now? Because every time I see them, it's more. And uh, she said, eight. It was a young, young couple, and I said, eight, wow. And, um, you know, it's like, I don't know, one every year and a half or so, I think, that, that it's been. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody has to do that. But they have the grace to do it. They have the physical. They're very healthy. Uh, it doesn't damage their health. They're very emotionally um, strong and stable. And they're very spiritual, spiritual people. They are daily communicants. And they are so happy. They are so happy. We should thank God 
for people like that. Now, if for whatever reason, whether physical, emotional, whatever reason, even financial sometimes, you can't do that. Don't feel so bad. You do what God lets you do. When you do the best with what you can. You know, my mother had three children. You know, that that's what she could handle. That's what she could do. Okay. That's all right. But let's not demean the people who have more. The artificial contraception mentality is there for many reasons, not the least of which is it's the enemy's tool and design. But, you know, an interesting thing is they say, well, we have a population problem in the world, which, by the way, we don't. That's an apparent problem. But you have to understand, you know, let's say a woman decides to have no children and thinks she's doing a great thing for society by not bringing any more mouths to feed in. Well, then where are the scientists going to come from who solve the food problem? Where are the doctors going to come from? Where are the nuclear physicists going to come from? Where are the priests going to come from? In Europe, the birth rate is very low. In places like Germany, I think France, uh, Christians, Catholics, aren't having children. I think the birth rate's less than one in some of those places, the Netherlands. And the Muslim people, who haven't been perverted in their understanding of this basic teaching, they're having lots of kids. Guess who's going to own Europe soon? Hmm? Uh, it, it is not going to be Christians. <clears throat> okay? That, that's something to think, not that they're bad people. I'm not saying that at all. But maybe they're smarter than some people. God's design is that we be fertile and multiply. That's the norm. Sexuality is a gift. It is sacred. It's not evil. It's good. Most people are called to be married. Most people are not called to be single. That's a very rare calling. It happens, but it's not the norm. Most people are not called to be priests. Most people are not called to be nuns. Most people are called to be married lay people. That is the norm. That is where the vast majority of the church's population are in that particular state in life. We often talk about a vocations crisis nowadays. Uh, it's acute. We were talking about it this morning. We had a vocations crisis. We had a shortage of priests a couple years ago. And everybody knew it. And now uh, somebody told me there, I don't know what the number was, 70, 80 or so priests that have been removed in Michigan alone. There are hundreds that have been removed in recent months all over the nation. That's a vocations crisis made more critical. But I'll tell you where we got an another crisis in another state in life. We have a vocations crisis in the married state. A lot of people aren't getting married. They're living in sin. A lot of people who are married, more than half, are getting divorced. There you, there's another vocations crisis that you don't hear about very much. Subvert that vocation, that state in life, and you subvert, you subvert them all. Where does every religious and priestly vocation come from? The family. Is there a state in life you can think of that doesn't come from the family? No. 
Where do people come from, the family? Hmm? Everybody has a mom and a dad. The demise of the family, the traditional family, is the demise of society. The breaking down of the family is the breaking down of civilization. Families are of enormous importance. As the family is wholesome, united, and sanctified, so too will society and civilization be wholesome, unified, and sacred. You understand that? Please understand that. But what do we do about it? The preservation of the family is in the hands of the family. Nobody's going to save it from the outside. Families have to be strengthened. Now, priests can help to strengthen the family by teaching the family, by administering the sacraments to the family, by giving good example to the family. But think back. Now, many of you are as old as I am or older. You've seen a lot. Now, I, I, I turned 55 this year. So I've seen the last 55 years' worth. Think about the changes that have taken place from when you were young to now. Think about the wholesomeness, the unity, and the sanctity of families when we were young compared to now. Now, there are still very good families, many of yours, I'm sure, but in general, I'm talking in general, the norm, okay? The average family. The average family is kind of 50-50. has been split by divorce. 50% or more of marriages end in divorce. Now, that's one of the attacks on the family, contemporary attack on the family. But wh what can we do about it? Family prayer. Remember Father Peyton, the Rosary Crusade? The family that prays together stays together. Let me read from you from the Holy Father's encyclical, The Gospel of Life. Very important encyclical. By the way, you don't have to be some great scholar or highly educated to learn your faith. It's not rocket science. It really isn't. You, uh, my, you know, somebody says, well, I don't have the gifts to understand it. Can you read? Now, anybody here who doesn't think they can do that, that's my one question to you. Are you able to read? <clears throat> Every now and then, rarely, somebody might say no. And then I direct them to my tapes. You don't even have to be able to read to learn your faith nowadays, right? Now let me read to you from this. And so you ought to read this. You ought to study the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You ought to study these key encyclicals. For you good family people, this is a conference on the family, you ought to read such documents as um, the Holy Father's uh, document, Familiaris Consortio. You ought to read this one, Evangelium Vitae, that's the gospel of life. Don't be put off by the Latin words. They're always translated. The document's not printed in Latin. You don't have to know that. It's in English. Okay? Within the people of life and the people for life, the family has a decisive responsibility. You are not irrelevant. You're not unimportant. You're the key. Strong families make for strong society. Strong families make for a strong country. The demise of the family is the demise of the country. The demise of civilization. And that's a fact. Don't doubt it. 
This responsibility flows from its very nature as a community of life and love founded upon marriage and from its mission. What's the mission of the family? To guard, reveal, and communicate life. I can go back to the first talk last night and put this in. What's the mission of the family? Well, the mission of the family, according to the Holy Father, John Paul II, the mission of the family is to guard, reveal, and communicate love. Here it is a matter of God's own love of which parents are co-workers. Mom and dad, you are co-workers with God and God's own love. As it were, interpreters when they transmit life and raise it according to his fatherly plan. This is the love that becomes selfless, receptiveness, and gift. Within the family, each member is accepted, respected, and honored precisely because he or she is a person. And if any family member is in greater need, the care which he or she receives is all the more intense and attentive. Mom and Dad, in your love for each other, you mutually express that love in terms of that are even physical the emotional, spiritual, deep love you have for each other is expressed at times physically. That is open to life. At times, life is conceived. You collaborate with God the Creator in bringing new life into existence. For that, your reward in heaven will be, on, it'll be beyond your wildest dreams. We take that for granted. Do not. Mom and Dad, for being faithful in your expression of love, collaborating with God the Father in bringing new life into existence, giving God children. Do you know how, in a manner of speaking, how happy our Father is when he receives a new child, when he creates a new child? Now, could God create that child by uh, snapping his divine fingers? Yes. Could God create that child uh, by thinking it into existence? Yeah. God can do anything. But does he do it that way? No. How does he do it? He only does it one way, through you. And he blesses you for your faithful collaboration in his work of creation. And your reward will be immense. Don't you ever forget that. The world won't tell you that. But the church is telling you that. That's a fact. That's the truth. And so every member of that family is treated with dignity and respect. Now, we struggle sometimes. How many, many, many times I've talked with moms and dads who said, oh, we have such trouble. Most of my kids don't go to church. Well, I sympathize with that. Most of my mother's kids didn't go to church either at a certain point. They all go to church now, but for a good long time they didn't, not a one of them. Now, my mother wasn't a bad person. She was a daily communicant. She was always faithful. What happened to us? Well, temporary insanity, perhaps. Huh? But she hung in there. She prayed the rosary every day. We all came back. Many parents say, Father, my son, my daughter is gay. And it breaks my heart. What should I do? You've got to love that child. 
What else am I going to talk? What does it say right here? Every member of the family is accepted, respected, and honored. Why? Because of their achievements? No. Precisely because he or she is a person. <clears throat> is a gay individual a person? Yes. Does their homosexuality change the reality of their personhood? No. Must they be respected? Yes. Must they be loved? Yes. My son is marrying a girl who isn't Catholic. My son, my daughter is marrying a person who isn't Christian. My son, my daughter is marrying a person who has no religion. What can I do? I, I often respond to that by saying, do you think there's any chance that your child doesn't know where you stand? <laughs> and, and the answer is universal. Oh, no. They know how I feel about it. Okay. Then as long as that's in place, you can love them. Because you've been telling them for 20 years or more what do, how, how, what's right and what's wrong. As long as you have, and as long as there's no confusion on that, so what should I do? You know, the problem is I don't want to condone or countenance uh, an immoral uh, act. You know, they're getting married in the gazebo in the park. Well, that's not what you would desire. They know it. But what do you do? Shun them? Nope. Hate them? Oh, no. you got to love them. Is that an excuse to stop loving them? No. That's like the case I mentioned. If somebody gets sick, you don't stop loving them. Every member of the family is respected and loved and honored because they are a person. What is the basic dignity of a human being? Personhood. Every human being is a person created in the image and likeness of God. That's why we respect every person. It doesn't matter what their race is. It doesn't matter what color they are, what nationality they are. Why do we respect them? Because they're white? Because they're black? Because they're oriental? Because they're European? Because they're American? No. You respect them because they are a person made in the image and likeness of God, and that's why every member of the family is honored, precisely because they are a person. And the ones who are in trouble, hmm? the ones who are in greater need, the ones who are in greater sin, should receive even more intense love and care. Now that is easy to say, hard to do. Boy, that really takes some effort, doesn't it? It takes a lot of grace sometimes. A lot of grace. But God will provide. And so, the family. It is a garden of holiness. It is an environment that should be wholesome, pure, and holy. And in that environment, virtue flourishes. And out from out of that environment, the world is enriched and is enabled to follow God's eternal design for creation. As we are faithful to that, we are happy and we prosper. As we are unfaithful to that, we become miserable, and things start to unravel. We are at a decisive time in history. The devil, and I say that literally, not figuratively, you know me, the, the enemy of souls, the devil, Satan, the adversary, he's done his homework. He has subverted family life. And now every corner of society is sick.
it is corrupt. Every profession, the corporate world, even inside the church, we have corruption, deception, and death. And it can all be traced back to the ills in the family. You've got to have strong families, wholesome families, courageous families, holy families. And from that holy environment, that garden of life, that garden of holiness, will flow every good thing. May God grant you the grace to have holy and beautiful families.